From Selma, Alabama, would you please welcome storyteller Miss Catherine Tucker Windham. I can't believe I'm 92, and but I am. And uh, my father said to me, but he says, said, when you're building your life, the most important things are the four L's. And the first L is listening. And it's a rare thing these days, listening, listening to the human voice, listening to one person talking to another person, listening. We have forgotten how to listen, how to sit down and talk and have a good time listening. My dad said, listen, God gave you two ears and one mouth, and he expected you to use them in that proportion. <laughs> and the next L is learning. You have to learn something different all your life. Don't ever quit learning. And laughing is the third L, he said. We've all got to laugh, laugh at ourselves, laugh at something every day. The world is a magical, wonderful place, he says, but we need to laugh together. Don't laugh at people, my father said. You laugh with people, and you can never hate anyone you've really laughed with. Laughter binds people together. The most important L is loving, loving. Said God put us here to love each other to enjoy each other, to help each other, to laugh together, to learn together, to listen together, but to love each other. And there's nothing that says I love you more pleasantly and more plainly than storytelling. Everybody here has stories that you need to tell, and now is the time to do it. Tell stories and tell each one with love, ending with I love you. Thanks so much to Catherine Tucker Windham speaking at the 2010 Alabama Storytelling Festival at 92 years old about the importance of stories. I'm Amy Antonucci welcoming you to our True Tales Live Zoom show April 27th, 2021. Thanks to those watching and listening and a special thanks to those here in our live online audience. Our mission at True Tales Live is to provide a space for people to tell their first person experience stories, stories that reflect our community's personal and cultural diversity and help us to bridge differences and build understanding and respect for everyone. We are so happy to be here with you on Zoom. We do have some suggestions for making the most of this online format. We really believe storytelling is an exchange between the teller and the listener. And here is how you can help us keep that going, okay? So if you're willing to keep your video on, you can have big physical reactions in order to connect with the rest of the audience and the tellers, let's practice. Okay, you ready? Everyone, show me shocked. How about sad? And then excitement. Well done, excellent. You can also express these and any other reactions in the chat box, which we do save and share later with our tellers, and they are always really, really grateful for that. Um, you can also put questions that you have for the tellers in the chat, because after the stories, we do have a, a Q&A period, and I'll be feeding them those questions. Tonight's show has the theme of lessons learned. Personally, I feel like We've just had at least a year full of lessons that I really, truly hope we are learning from. Tonight, Nina Lasiga, Steve Varnum, and Pat Spaulding are going to share some lessons from their own journeys. After the stories, we have short Q&A and then the backstory 15-minute interview that David Frainer will do with tonight's teller, Steve Varnum. But first, Pat Spaulding is coming on to act as MC. So join me in welcoming Pat with excitement. Why, thank you. I'm flattered by your excitement. I'm excited to introduce Nina Lasiga, who is an excellent story she's told for us before. Very entertaining. Thank you, Nina. She lives in Stratford, Connecticut, is a storyteller and 
ukuleleist. There is such a thing. After a 30 year career as a corporate chemist, she embarked upon a second career as a performing artist. Nina has performed on PBS's Stories from the Stage and is a member of the Story City Troupe in Connecticut. She also runs the Bridgeport Story Exchange and is one of the organizers of Pecha Kucha Night Bridgeport, which is a visual storytelling. Tonight, she'll tell us about a surprise discovery that led her to more cheerful surprises. And finally, to the realization that she wasn't dreaming large enough. The title of her story is Impossible Dream. Okay, Nina. Thank you, Pat. Great to be here tonight. It was a year like no other. I spent lots of time walking along the Connecticut shore on the beach. It opened my mind it uncluttered it and brought all kinds of possibilities to my thinking. It was 2014 and I had retired in March. I was trying to find my new normal. I worked for 30 years as a chemist in the consumer goods industry and I had this routine and now I didn't. What I did was I tried every morning to walk along the beach just like I had done before going to work. I always did that unless it was raining outside. And I, it was Labor Day and it was a beautiful day outside and I decided let's do it. And you know, I, I was at a point in my life that I wanted to figure out what I was going to do. My career coach told me, don't worry, take your time, it will come. I wanted my new life now. When I got to the beach, it's a really rustic beach with no facilities, I walked to the left and to the left are cottages on top of piers and the piers jut into the water except for low tide. So I walked on the wet sand and I was walking in front of all the piers and the cottages and I was looking at the seashells and trying to find sea glass and thinking about how everything tumbles around in the Long Island Sound till it makes it to the shore. And I would think about what is my next step? Well, I kept walking, it was time to turn around so I walked up to the high tide line. And when I did that, I actually walked under people's houses. It really felt like I was trespassing. I really shouldn't be doing that. But the piers made such a beautiful sieve for all the natural things in the ocean. And I just loved the pickings there. Well, I looked a little bit up and into the distance and what I saw was the glimmer of green, green. And I'm like going, wow, I think I'm about to see some really good sea glass. And so I walk over to it and I am shocked. It's a Coke bottle with a cork on top. And I bend down and take a look. There's a message inside. I was stunned. I thought it was a prank. I turned around and looked to see if there was anybody watching me. There wasn't. I was by myself. It was for real. Throughout my life, I have thought about finding a message in a bottle, but I never thought about what to do if I actually found one. My gut reaction was, oh, I'm so excited. No one's going to believe me. Let me take a photo but I didn't bring a camera. I didn't bring a cell phone with me. So I looked in the distance and at the next jetty, there were three people. So I picked the bottle up and walked over to them. And I asked them, would you help me take a photo? And I couldn't get a photo. One thing I decided is that this was too good to do on my own. I wasn't gonna take this bottle home and uncork it. I asked the strangers, would you like to see what's inside? And they all nodded yes. So I 
twisted off the cork and I carefully pulled out the note that was inside. It was beautiful. It was burnt around the edges. It was written in pencil in a child's handwriting. And it said, hello, my name is Luca. And I put this bottle in the water at West Beach Drive and my dream is that it travels really far. It gets found. It was dated the day before and went about a half a mile. Well, everybody around me, they just disappeared without saying a word. And I thought too bad because it doesn't really matter how long it was in the water. This little boy with the big dream, he made my day. This was epic. And I decided on the spot that I was going to do whatever it took to make his dream go forward. And on his note, he gave me his email. It says, if you find this bottle, will you email me? So I got home and I did. And I said, Luca, this is Nina. I love you. I found your message in a bottle. And I'm going to create a second note and put it alongside of yours and toss it back out. Let's see where it goes. And while I waited for him to reply, I started to write a note of my own. And I explained what happened. And it was a whole page long. And I said, I know what I want to do. I want to burn it around the edges just like Luca. So I lit a match and the whole sheet went up in flames. I had to toss it into the kitchen sink. But on my second attempt, it worked. And then I contacted the local newspaper, the local TV station. I contacted the Coca-Cola company and they helped share this story. It took a few days and Luca wrote back, Nina, I'm so sorry. I'm only allowed to use my iPad twice a week. I am so happy you had so much fun with this bottle. Just keep all the stuff inside. And there was like a little sea glass and nothing particularly fun, but I really was impressed. And I get an email from his mother. Hi, this is Luca's mom. I wanna let you know when he woke up that morning, he was determined to make a message in a Coke bottle. Him and his father, they went to Family Dollar and they got a glass Coke bottle just for this occasion. They worked on it together, then cast it out afloat. And so it was time for me to do the needy. It was time for that bottle to go back into the water. So I studied the tide tables and I wanted to make sure I went to the beach at high tide. So when I tossed it out, it would be taken out to, to, the, to the sea. And I got there at the beach, it was four o'clock in the afternoon and there were other people there. And I told everybody what I was about to do. I didn't want them thinking I'm just sending trash out into the, into the Long Island Sound. And everybody was like so excited and, we, I involved everybody, I fed the seagulls, and then I go, one, two, three, here we go. And I said, I wonder if it's found, will it be sooner or later? And two weeks later, I get an email and the subject line says bottle, and I don't recognize the names. And it says, hello, we are the Ellers from Port Jefferson, New York. That's 29 miles away across the Long Island Sound. We were walking along the breakwater and we noticed this bottle sticking out of the seaweed and we weren't gonna pay any attention to it, but there was a cork on top. Well, we wanna let you know your bottle leaked, but we dried it out. We, we really thought the note was gonna fall apart, so we had to break the bottle. But here you can see it's all intact. We are so glad you wrote in pencil. Here are scanned copies of the notes inside. And it showed mine and Luca's. They said, we wanna thank you so much, both of you for involving us in this endeavor. We 
are going to make a third note and put it into a new bottle and cast it out. Now we are avid boaters and we know all about the currents in the Long Island Sound and they're kind of fickle. It could take years for that bottle to reappear, but it will. Well, I was still so excited. I wanted to tell more people. And so I pitched a story to the Mark Twain House in Hartford, Connecticut at a large storytelling event and it got accepted. And that night I was on the stage and people were listening and they were reacting. And I felt at home. I felt like me. I wanted to do this again and again. And again, and what I realized, this little boy with a big dream showed me that I wasn't dreaming large enough. And so I took the next step. I became a storyteller. And from that day onward, I have a treasure trove of impossible dreams. Thank you. Thanks, Nina. <laughs> We've got a, a good start for our storytelling. That's a story about storytelling. Excellent. Next up, we've got a, a new teller to us, but not to him. Steve Barnum from Concord, New Hampshire, is currently the Communications and Marketing Director of New Hampshire Community Loan Fund. But most importantly, he enjoys his position as the old guy of a sprawling, rowdy, and hilarious four-generation family. Steve has been a professional storyteller for more than 40 years, most of those as a journalist for several New England um, newspapers. He's been recognized by the New Hampshire Press Association as Writer of the Year and is a Child and Family Services Voice for Children awardee. Steve believes in the power of story to shape ourselves and the world around us. Tonight, he'll share a story that he's never before told publicly, one that forever changed how he views and interacts with bullies. Its title is Bully For You. All right, Steve, come on up. Hi, everyone. So, some days in April smell like spring. This was one of those bright, clear days, and we had big plans. I was nine years old, and I'd been invited for a rare sleepover at Billy's house. Not rare because it was Billy's house, but rare that I would be invited for a sleepover, really, by any of my classmates. I grew up in a small country town, and I'd been adopted out of the foster care system. In the 1950s and 60s, that was the kind of thing that everyone in a small town knew about you. I was also by far the youngest kid in fourth grade, a consequence of my being the first child in our family and my adopted mom's determination to teach me to read early. Now, it might surprise some of you in the audience who know me as my size XL self, uh, uh, actually, let's make that double XL. Thank you, COVID. But I was a severely skinny kid with a great big head. My parents pestered the doctor because of how little I ate. His response was always, when he gets hungry, he'll eat. Actually, I wasn't often hungry. I, I kind of looked like a carnival lollipop with legs. So to be invited for a sleepover, wow. Uh, it was April vacation, and Billy and I decided we'd go exploring the following day. He had a bike I could borrow with sisters, and we got up early, made peanut butter sandwiches, pretty much the only thing I did eat, and set out on our adventure. Billy lived in the center of town, close by the library, the common, a couple churches, and the town's only doctor, pretty typical for a New England town. It was three tenths of a mile straight up a hill from the river and the railroad tracks. 
About a minute after we left his house, we headed down that long, steep hill. Now, at the time, no country roads had bicycle lanes or shoulders for that matter. Biking near the edge of the road meant constantly dodging rim-bending craters or uh, risking wipeouts in soft sand, not to mention encounters with inf- unfriendly dogs. Also in 1962, no one wore bike helmets. And that was a good thing. So as we whizzed down the center of River Street, the wind whipped our faces and hair and it watered our eyes. I'll never forget the feeling. It really felt like flying. It was amazing. And it stayed amazing until in the intersection at the bottom of the hill, a car crested the railroad bridge coming right at me. And then I was laying on my parents' couch. Pillows and towels were piled under my head. An ice-filled cloth filled my mouth and I had no idea where I was, why I was, or probably even what I was. My head hurt, my face hurt, everything above my shoulders hurt. And even without the bloody cloth in my mouth, the noises coming out of it, well, they were nothing like human speech. So I've been lucky enough to miss the car, but not so lucky that I also missed the railroad bridge. My mouth and my chin took the shot. All my front teeth were gone, my gums were shredded, and my jaw just didn't seem to work. I learned later that after retrieving my bloody self, one of my parents had returned to the bridge and actually found my teeth, hoping a surgeon could reattach them. But when we got to the hospital, they were told there wasn't enough intact bone to attach the the teeth to. So yeah, I was a concussed, bleeding, toothless mess. Probably, thankfully, I remember almost nothing beyond that first rude jolt of consciousness. I don't know how my face was put back together or by whom or where or how long it took. I mean, none of that. Though, if any of you listeners out there were part of that effort, seriously, thank you. And I don't remember crying and begging my parents not to make me go back to school, although I'm sure I did. Because Carnival Lollipop Head Boy was now Toothless Jack-O-Lantern Boy. And those of you who were ever kids might remember how kind and empathic fourth graders are, particularly when they're running in feral packs. I did have to return to school before the end of the year. I do remember wanting to be invisible. I do remember wanting to be anywhere but where I was during the morning recess, which was standing at the edge of the playground, hands in pockets, head down, hoping no one would talk to me, come near me, or even acknowledge my existence. It was a few minutes, maybe it was a lot of minutes, I don't know. But after a while, out of the corner of my eye, I saw Dougie. Dougie was a tough, mean kid. He was a bully and proud of it. He was two or maybe three years older than me, and I was terrified of him. This was like a sixth grader who already walked with a swagger, shoulders back, hips leading. Whenever I saw him downtown strutting with a cigarette pack rolled up in the sleeve of a dirty white t-shirt, I got out of his way. Dougie's family was poor. He had older brothers and sisters. And thinking back now, there probably wasn't much left for him. His teeth were rotted and the ones in front were pointed, which made him look like he was snarling even when he might have been smiling. Dougie really liked to knock kids around. He swore before the rest of us swore. We caught up sooner or later. He, con- he constantly picked fights. I once saw him fight a much bigger kid and get knocked down again and again and again to where most anyone would have stayed down and stopped the beating. Dougie didn't. 
Now Dougie was walking his excruciatingly slow walk directly toward me. A walk that almost said, come at me, I dare you. I froze, what else could I do? I knew he was gonna beat me. I just hoped he wouldn't hit me in the mouth. I buried my chin in my chest and I stood there like a stone. Dougie kept walking. My heart was pounding and I'm sure I started to cry. In my memory of that morning, there's no other motion. There's no sound. It's like a movie in which the edges of the frame are blurred and only the center is in focus. There's just Dougie walking toward me. Now he's 10 feet away from me. And now he's six feet away from me. And I bring up my arms up in front of my face to block the punches I knew were coming. Dougie walked right up in front of me and stopped. I could smell his breath. He didn't say a word. And he stood there until I dropped my rope-a-dope stance, raised my chin, and looked at his face. He stared into my eyes, took what seemed to be an endless breath, and finally said, if anyone gives you any trouble, you let me know and I'll take care of it. He nodded once, then spun on his heel and slow walked away. I have never forgotten the feeling of being that frightened and that vulnerable. I'm sad, I'm really sad that I never thanked Dougie for his kindness. And I never ever looked at bullies the same way again. Thanks, Steve. So um, did you put him in to service at his word? <laughs> I, ne I never had to. Uh, the fourth graders were, were much kinder than I give them credit for. <laughs> Good story. Okay, I'm gonna give it over to Amy now because uh, I'm up next. Thank you. Um, great, I'm sure we'll have more questions for the Q&A. Put them in the chat, folks. Um, I know I have some for Steve. All right, but right now I'm introducing Pat Spaulding. Pat recently moved from the seacoast to live in Harrisville, New Hampshire. After earning her living as a touring puppeteer with her business, Hey Penny Theater, she retired to learn how to twirl a baton with a leftist marching band and play the bass, 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 drum. Pat has been writing and telling stories for most of her life. She volunteered to be the MC for True Tales Live in 2014 and has enjoyed that role ever since, she says. Pat appreciates the opportunity to listen to, learn from, and encourage the stories of others. Tonight, she will share a brand new story about how the recent pandemic pushed her to relocate and change her life. Let's, let's welcome Pat with Paddling Home. Thanks, Amy. It's February, 1951. I am four years old, wrapped inside a snowsuit, mittens, boots, and blankets, my father, is pulling me on a toboggan across a big, sparkling, snow-covered lake. My mother walks beside us holding a wrapped bundle that is my baby brother, Dean. When I ask dad where we're going, he answers in one word, camp. It's April 14th, 2020. My 73rd birthday ice out happened less than a week ago and I am paddling a canoe all by myself across this cold and empty lake against a very strong wind because, because one month ago, COVID-19 put a lockdown on everything I know to be normal. I live alone, I'm okay with that. 
But when I was quarantined in my own house and told, don't go out, stay home, wash your hands, wear a mask. It isn't safe to have friends over or to breathe. Stay where you are. What? Nothing was safe but confinement, containment. I had to break out. So after a month of this, I fled my house to feel the cold air on my face, the rush of wind and water, to use all of my strength to keep this damn canoe pointed into the wind to get to camp. If my brother Dean was here, well, maybe we'd be a pod, me in the bow, him in the stern, both of us paddling forward. Or maybe if I'd stayed married or if dad was still around or if I'd had kids, maybe, maybe, oh, maybe. I know it isn't safe to be paddling through this rough wind and cold water all by myself, but damn it, it makes me feel alive. All through my childhood, my family set out on hiking adventures, rowing, sliding across the ice, paddling canoes to get to camp. You see, there's no road to it. Camp is a very primitive cabin set in the woods on the edge of a pristine lake surrounded by hundreds of acres of conservation land. Built as a hunting lodge in the late 1800s, it remains pretty much the same. There's no electricity. No running water, no plumbing, of course, just an outhouse, no Wi-Fi. A hand pump draws water from the lake for dishes and washing up, and an old household regal wood stove is there for heat and cooking. At camp, we'd swim or sit around the campfire, listening to loons call back and forth, eat popcorn by the wood stove, share stories, tell jokes, laugh. My family laughed a lot. It's summer. Dean and I are teenagers and he and my father are having a cannonball diving contest off Elephant Rock, a big boulder with a deep drop off. My mother and I are cheering them on when dad perches on the edge of the boulder, spreads his arms wide and commands, watch this little beauty. Just as he launches himself off the rock, my mother shouts out, all eyes on the little beauty. Dad starts laughing mid-dive and splatters into the water in a horrendous, undignified belly flop. For the rest of that summer, we all referred to him as the little beauty. My mother got a big kick out of that. They had a good marriage. They enjoyed each other's company. And they enjoyed us kids. I got divorced when I was 59 years old. Surprisingly, being single in my 60s was pretty good. I lived in the seacoast New Hampshire, close to the beach and a stone's throw from Portsmouth where there's always something going on. After retiring, I learned how to twirl the baton with a leftist marching band. And I started telling stories to adult audiences, joined True Tales Live, got involved with shows and workshops, active, healthy, and always very, very busy. I breezed through my 60s. Then, 70 hit. And this niggling question, what's next? I loved where I lived, but maintaining a house with two big garages on three and a half acres of property, it had become way too much. I needed to downsize. So I hired Ruth, a professional organizer who knew how to dig in and get things done. We sorted, categorized, sold, gave away furniture, art, books, toys, tools, technology, lots of stuff. Ruth pushed me to look on Zillow for condos. But where? Even though my house and property was too much, I couldn't envision living any place I liked better. But Wanting to convince myself and Ruth, of course, that I was making forward progress, I signed up for the free luncheons to join other retirees, four plates of chicken something, coffee, dessert, followed by a seductive sales pitch for active retirement living. Everything will be taken care of. 
within this new community of like-minded friends. You no longer have to cook. It's your choice every step of the way. No risk of becoming a burden to your children or family. Everything is taken care of. You'll be safe and protected right here for the rest of your life every step of the way. Right. I mean, if my health collapses, I don't want to be a burden to anybody. Everything will be taken care of, all risk and challenge removed in exchange for confinement, containment. No, no, not yet. But I didn't let out that howl. Instead, I went to more free luncheons trying to convince myself that this plan was practical. And at my age, without children, the responsible thing to do, maybe. Maybe, maybe, I give up. I can't keep this canoe pointed. The wind is too strong. So I stop paddling and let the boat flounder to shore. It's okay. I can get to camp from here, pull the canoe up to the bushes, tie it up, and then bushwhack the west, rest of the way there. It's mid-April and the air has the feel of snow coming in. About 10 years after the summer of the little beauty, my brother had an accident that might not have happened had he not been 24 years old and feeling immortal. Dean was working off an island in the middle of the Hudson River in New York, staining for samples of pollution, a boat, the only transportation to and from the shore, the island had come untied and was speedily drifting away. Trying to do the responsible thing, my brother dove into the river to swim after it. Maybe he'd been the one who tied it up. We never asked. Knowing would not have changed the outcome. The current was too strong, it pulled him under and he drowned. This accident broke the heart of our family. It broke a lot of things, but not the single determination of those of us who were left to keep on going to camp. I remember my mother saying, I taught both of you how to swim right here, how to, how to feel safe in the water. Dean practiced his strokes. He got stronger and more confident Maybe if he wasn't such a good swimmer, maybe if he hadn't felt so confident, he wouldn't have swum after that damn boat. Maybe, maybe. There is risk in every decision with no guarantee of safety. It snowed on the night of my 73rd birthday at camp. I lit a fire in the wood stove and had the best sleep I'd had in months. The next morning, I hiked out to the canoe, pulled it into the water and started paddling back to the car when once again, <laughs> the strong wind kept pushing the boat sideways and I couldn't get the thing to point. But this time, I didn't struggle to keep moving because the wind was blowing me in the right direction. So I stopped paddling, just sat in the canoe and let the wind push it sideways all the way down the lake back to where I'd started. The pandemic stopped me from being so busy. The wind stopped me from paddling. The lull of both stopped me from trying to figure everything out before making a decision. I sold my house and found a small place to rent. It's 20 minutes from the lake instead of a two hour drive. So now in any season, whenever I want, I can do what my family has always done every step of the way to find our way home. I will go to camp. Thank you.
lovely Pat. Thank you. Um, we're gonna have we have time for a little bit of question and answer here. Please put them in the chat. There's already a few there. <clears throat> but actually, I thought maybe we should start by seeing Pat paddling. There she goes. And I think, let, let's, let's see here. I think the next one, nope, never mind. I'll have to bring it back up. The next one here is where she's paddling to. That's camp, right, Pat? Yeah, it's beautiful. Did you stack all that wood? That's the first question of the evening. I get help. I, I have a lot of volunteer help. You want to sign up, contact me. Great. All right. So um, I have a question here. Oh, first, I want to say, looking at chat, I think we may have uh, a winner in our farthest away um, in our audience. Is it Lisa from Oregon is uh, here? So cool. <laughs> I think so. she used to live here. So I think many of you know her. Very cool. Um, okay. Now I have a question that came in for Steve. So Kamisha was asking, did you ever see or talk to your bully again? Um, and we might even, you know, whether that's back then or, you know, have you made efforts to try to track this person down or so talk to, can you tell us about that? Um, well, we went to the same school. So uh, yeah, I saw him and, uh, and I'm sure I talked to him from time to time, but you know, nothing, nothing memorable, let's say uh, came out of it. Uh, but yeah, we were from the same small town. There was one, only one elementary school in town. And so he was around, I'm pretty sure he dropped out like the moment that he could drop out of school. And so I didn't see him a lot after that. Has it occurred to you to try to track him down and tell him now how he made an impact in your life? Just one. Um, not until now, but that's a, that's a great idea. <laughs> you might get a whole new story out of it. Could be. All right. Um, thanks, Steve. Okay, we have a, a question here. Judith has to know, Pat, did you paint those polka dots on the canoe? Oh, no. Th that canoe was bought by my dad in probably late 60s, early 70s from Old Town. It was when, um, during the psychedelic era, an Old Town decided to um, design some canoes for popular appeal. They had paisley ones, and this one, we refer to as the Wonder Bread because it is actually, the polka dots are embedded in the, um, oh, what do you call this stuff, fiberglass. And um, when we first bought it, it was really bright and it gets duller, but <laughs> Old Town discontinued the line. I think they're a little embarrassed about it. It didn't suit their image. <laughs> Oops. All right, cool. Um, I wanted to ask Nina, um, have, is, is there a next chapter? Have you heard it from anyone else? Is this really where the story ends so far? Uh, Tell us this is where the story ends so far, but it's interesting as I have told it, where the family actually gave me permission to use the child's full name. And someone came up from the audience and said, I know that family. And so uh, it just continues to live on. And I have this image that it gets found a few more times before he goes to college. Because imagine his college entrance essay could be, I put this message in a bottle when I was nine years old. And at some point, we had to uh, change it out. Someone had to change it out to the two liter size. And they tell this story a lot because we don't really know, granted the, the Long Island Sound only has one outlet to the Atlantic Ocean, 
but it doesn't mean it didn't get there. And so it could really end up anywhere. Nice, thanks, Nina. And um, we're lucky it happened and, and launched you into storytelling. We've heard so many wonderful stories. Yeah, I was so scared the first time I told that story. Not only did I pitch it to one event, I pitched it to two big events in Hartford and they both said yes. And that just gave me the confidence because I knew it wasn't, it wasn't perfect and it probably still isn't, but still people, people were taken by the story. And that um, I guess a lot of people since hearing that story have put messages in a bottle, which I'm happy about. That's lovely. Um, let me see here, ah, okay. Um, so Steve, I believe I have a photo of your, um, your elementary school. Is that what you sent us? Yep. Let's take a quick look at that here and get this setting in our mind for where this story happened. It's a little blurry because I'll bet it was scanned in from an old photo, right? Oh yeah, it was lift, lifted off the internet. <laughs> um, and where again, where, what, this was? That's in Brookfield, Massachusetts, Brookfield Elementary School. Yeah, looks familiar. Well, that's great and um, I, you know, I, ironically, I fell off my bike and bashed out one of my teeth when I, when I was a kid, too. Not as bad as you. In fact, you made me feel really lucky, you know, <laughs> that it wasn't that bad. But, um, yeah, that's a real, real, ugh, ugh, right? Everyone went, ugh, right? <laughs> um, okay. Let's see what else we have. Ah, okay, so I have another, I guess I did not leave up Pat's photo long enough. So we're gonna, we're gonna bring that back. Um, remember to ask more questions while I am doing this. Yes, yeah, so here's Pat paddling. And those, those polka dots that we now understand what they're all about, right? Pat on the lake. Embedded in fiberglass, those polka dots. It doesn't look as uh, cheerfully bright today. It gets paler and yellower every year. <clears throat> all right. Um, any other questions? Pat, weren't you trying to get one from, uh, ask Steve something earlier? Oh, um, well, I think it was just, if he had taken advantage of the bully's, uh, um, <laughs> you know, offer to protect him if anything came up and he seemed to say no. Yeah, he had no cause to rearrange anyone's facial features. Hmm. That sounds for the best. <laughs> so, um, Nina, I was going to ask you, you, you said you've told this uh, story a lot of places. Want to tell us a little more about where you have been telling your stories, this one and, and others, and, um, this, and for how long you've been doing this? Okay, I've been storytelling for seven years now. And this story is also a visual story on the Pachacacha Bridgeport uh, website. And um, this, you know, this, I've told stories up and down the, the East Coast, both in person and virtually. Right as COVID was about to hit, I was really doing a lot of performing in New York City. And I miss that as I wait. Hopefully, I've been doing it virtually, but I just, I can't wait to go into the city. And really exciting coming up um, for me is that in New Haven, Connecticut, there's an arts and ideas festival coming up. And it's gonna be both for me live and in person. So you're gonna be able to see um, one of my newer story, that's an adult story about Caribbean aphrodisiacs. Uh, and then that's, that's a 10 minute story on, on a stage. 
And then I'm also doing a story slam. That, that one's on June 19th. On June 26th, I'm doing a, a story slam with um, many well-known storytellers and um, bringing back the good old story of me doing the no pants subway ride. And this is, this is actually requested by the organizers. That's a great story. Penny had a question. Did you see that, Amy? About yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and Kamisha's going to have to repost her question because I can't find it. Um, yes. So Penny wanted to ask Steve if you had any sense of why he he was moved to offer this protection to you. Yeah, I think it's because his, as I mentioned in the story, his own teeth were. They were bad. I mean, they were they were black. They were rotted, and I'm sure that uh, he got made fun of a lot and probably beat up a lot uh, because of the way his mouth looked. And so I think that that was the connection. Uh, you know, he saw what I looked like and what my reaction to it was, and uh, obviously felt really protective. Uh, because I think he related to exactly where I was at that moment. <clears throat> yeah, got it. Once again, yeah. it's this ability to connect with each other and understand each other that brings out the best in us, right? There's, a, there's another funny story that definitely wouldn't, isn't long enough to make it into this kind of forum, but uh, later I was playing high, high school basketball and I had, you know, a bridge, false teeth, uh, wasn't wearing a mouth guard, which was a very poor decision, and got hit in the face with an elbow as I was going up for the rebound. So, you know, knocked all my plastic teeth out, thankfully, just those. So, uh, so I spit them into my hand and ran by the bench and yelled to the coach, hey, take these. And as I ran by, I threw my teeth in his hand and kept running down the court. <laughs> he quickly called a timeout to ask me what the H was going on here. <laughs> oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> um, Steve, I, I, now I, I know that uh, David's going to be talking with you after, but I, I was going to just ask, I hear that you've done a lot of storytelling. This is not your first um, go around at this. What, could you just say a few words about where else you've been telling? Well, my, my storytelling has been journalism. Um, for most of my, I was 25 years in journalism and for a fair number of those years, I was either a columnist or a feature writer. Um, and I've always believed that if you want to persuade someone, if you want someone to understand what you're talking about, to retain the information, you tell them a story. And so uh, this is actually the first time I've orally uh, presented a story in public, but in print, you know, many thousands of times. Yes, got it. Great. Um, I've got another one for Nina. So Nina, have you done any more messages in bottles? Kamisha just wants to know, how should she be scouring the beaches? How many have you got out there? Well, soon. Actually, I've been waiting. And um, someone, actually, one of my career coaches gifted me message in a bottle wine. So I have a wine bottle named Message in a Bottle. So I'm like going, now that's my style. So yes, and I will let Kamisha know when I cast it off. So maybe he's gonna go to Portsmouth. Do you wanna, are you willing to give us a sneak preview of what you might put in there or, or your message might- well, I, I, think, I think it will be, it will be the, the, the original story and then the after story of, uh, of um, how this little boy with the big dream like threw a lasso out to me and I kind of like grabbed it and like going, 
yeah, let this little boy show grandma how to dream big, you know? And, and um, my sister thought I was crazy. She goes, what's with you? I was just like going way out of my way to do things for this little boy to make it happen. And I said, just this inner spirit. It's like, I have to get, I have to get this done. And so I just, I think of anything, um, it's his spirit lives on. And I can't wait, he, they actually, I mean, I can't wait to someday cross paths with him because his family has one of those beach cottages on that, on that beach, so you never know. And I was just really charmed how the family trusted me. Like, if you think about it, I was a stranger and they were like sending me not only his picture but his sister's pictures and then and that. And so, yeah. So, um, Kamisha, if you have any ideas of what I should say in that bottle, happy to take suggestions. And uh, Nita, I don't know if you will have much to say on this, but John felt strongly that it was really good how you, you know, made sure folks knew you weren't throwing trash into the ocean. Um, because there is such a huge problem. And I guess you know, John is saying that masks in the ocean are now really piling up. Do you, do you Nina, have anything to say about um, what not to put in the ocean? Oh, yes. Actually, you know, actually, I think if we have to pay attention to our own trash, like especially those netted bags that we buy fruits and vegetables to cut them up and the and the six pack O-rings to like cut them up. And I'm a globe trekker. So I've seen my, you know, share of trash in the ocean and it's just like mind boggling. So I think recycle, repurpose. And um, today I started to compost. Someone like, kind of, so like I, yeah. So like someone like this, this guy who's in the, or in the um, farmer's market does organic fruit. He goes, well, do you compost? And I'm like going, no. And I go, but I, I save all my vegetable scraps and I make soup. And he was like, just shaking his head. So the other day I made soup and after, with all this leftover vegetables and I found some brown leaves and now I'm starting my pile. So I'm inspired. That's awesome. There's many composters here and we welcome you to the club. You're going to love it. <laughs> All right. So I am going to say a few words before um, we turn this over to David to speak more with Steve. Thank you all for being with us, especially our tellers Yay! and our live audience. Talk for yourselves. Um, as I said, we'll soon move to the backstory 15 minute interview, but first let me tell you a few things. Our next True Tales Live Zoom show, Tuesday, May 25th, 7 p.m. Our theme is blunders. So practice your laughing, okay? Um, go to truetaleslivenh.org to find the link to register. I'll bet Kamisha will put that in the chat for those of you actually here. We're also now taking signups for tellers for our fall shows. Um, before you sign up, we encourage you to first attend one of our monthly workshops, which are also now on Zoom. Um, the next one is May 4th, 7 to 8.30 p.m. You'll get feedback on your story and you'll practice telling on the Zoom platform, which we find is really helpful for, for folks. Um, you can contact us, info at truetaleslivenh.org to find out more and get yourself registered for the workshop. Watch us on Portsmouth Public Media TV, Comcast Channel 98, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 p.m., Saturdays at 1 p.m., and anytime as video on demand or as a podcast. Go to truetaleslivenh.org to easily access all of that so you don't have to remember much of what I just said. Let's thank a few of those who make this show possible. John Lovering, Pat Spaulding, David Frainer, Sarah Bedingfield, Sam Adams, and Kamisha Foley. I'm Amy Antonucci, and before we move to the backstory 15 minute interview of Steve Varnum, we invite you to join us to shake off the Zoom cobwebs here. We're gonna have one minute of movement and fun with our now traditional True Tales dance party. We've been having a great time with it and hope that you will put on your video and stand up or move in your chair, however you want to do it, and join us. 
Also switching to gallery makes it way, way more fun. Um, John, are you ready? Dance party and then we'll come back for the backstory. John on his new computer probably has to remember to unmute and things like that, right John? We're getting warmed up. We've heard, we can hear it in our heads now. Welcome back and welcome to our storytelling conversation. My name is David Frainer, and I'm here with Steve Arnum, as Amy said, longtime storyteller, first time True Tales Live teller. And so, welcome, Steve. Thank you. We call this segment the backstory, where we look in back of the curtain to learn about the story behind the stories and the story behind the storyteller. And tonight, our conversation is with Steve. Thanks for that. Uh, as it was mentioned, Steve, you're the Director of Communication and Marketing for the Community Loan Fund. Um, but as Amy noted, and Pat too, before that, you had a career in journalism. And I thought we might start there because it strikes me that journalism and first-person storytelling are, so to speak, storytelling cousins, but in the end are really quite different and perhaps even at, odds in some ways. So I wonder about your thoughts about the relationship between journalism and first person storytelling. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, uh, that's a great insight. Um, when you, when you're doing straight journalism, when you're reporting or writing uh, feature articles, uh, you generally keep your, your own voice and your own self and your own experience out of the written word, although for sure, I mean, I believe that we are all are influenced by everything we've lived through, by everything we've done, by everything we've, we've experienced. And there's no way that that does not bleed into someone's reporting and writing. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I've written about people with whom I could not disagree more uh, about their, you know, political stance or something that they're doing. Uh, yet, as a storytelling journalist, uh, you're in kind of just the facts mode. And so, Steve, you put your yourself aside, and you know what what is factual, what can be backed up uh, by documents of some sort. Um, interestingly. At different times during my newspapering, I toggled back and forth between being a, a reporter and, and feature writer and being a columnist. And as a columnist, of course, you can write in first person or you can write about other things, but inject your own opinion, your own thought and that kind of thing. Um, so one of the columns that I wrote about that I think uh, at least in my memory, I got more comments on than anything else I ever wrote was, uh, I wrote a piece for Mother's Day. And I, I mentioned in my piece tonight that I was an adoptee. Uh, I found my birth mom when I was 25 years old. Oh, wow. And from then until uh, about six years ago when she passed, uh, we, had a, we had a relationship. Uh, and I, of course, had a relationship with my adoptive parents. So for Mother's Day one year, I wrote a column about my two mothers uh, who could not have been any different. 
<laughs> they just could not have been any different as personalities, worldview, the way they dressed, you name it. Uh, but wrote a column about how, you know, kind of celebrating them, celebrating their differences. And then out of their differences came me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for what that's worth, you know. Uh, so, so, uh, so I did have the opportunity to to flex both both types of muscles, and I can't say that I like one more than the other. I, I enjoy telling other people's stories at least as much as I enjoy telling my own, and it kind of takes me off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> but but they are kind of different in the sense that there is this you might call it the myth of the objective journalist. Yeah. Um, although I would guess I'd say that uh, the notion of objectivity in journalism is under threat these days. <laughs> but that's probably a whole other conversation. Well, I, I think when you call it a myth, you're, you're right on. I mean, there's no perfect you, you, objectivity, right? You, ha you have to know what your biases are, and then you have to push them aside. But you can't push them aside and you can't say, this isn't going to get into my story until you've identified it and you know what it is when you see it. So if I'm interview, so interviewing someone uh, and, you know, I feel the hairs on the back of my neck start going up, uh, I have to push it back down and say, you know, my job here is to you know, convey as close as I can to the truth of the situation. And I, ha and yes, I have strong feelings. I always have strong feelings, but I need to push those aside. And I think that's, that's what good reporters do. <clears throat> I also want to talk about storytelling uh, with respect to the loan fund. And Steve, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Andy Goodman and the Goodman Center in Los Angeles. I'm a huge fan. Ah, <laughs> I'm a huge fan. I'm on his email list. I've seen him present. Yeah. Ah, so uh, we're on the same wavelength here. Um, as far as I know, he was one of the really early movers and shakers in pointing out the important difference between story, first person story, storytelling and just the uh, abstract use of data, the use of abstract data. Um, and I had a chance to go hear him some years ago. And uh, so I've been a big fan ever since. So the question, of course, is did, do you use some of his uh, kinds of work in the loan fund work that you do? do you oh, do, definitely. Do um, I, mean, I, I would say that our, our best and biggest marketing tools are what we call the impact stories. Uh, that mostly I report and write. There's a whole section on our website of stories about people we've helped. And uh, Julie Eads, who founded the Community Loan Fund 38 years ago, retired last June. But when I was hired as the communications and marketing guy, she said, okay, this is what you need to know. We succeed when our borrowers succeed, period. OK, so if we're going to tell stories about our impact, why people should invest in us, why people should donate to us, why people should partner with us, that's going to be told through the stories of the people we have served. Um, and, and, we'll, and we'll stand or fall on those stories. So very much so. Uh, and Andy Goodman, man, that. You know, if you, if you consider yourself a communicator in any sphere, you, you got to know his work. He's a pretty brilliant guy. Yeah, he really, really is. Well, it's, it's fun that we're on the same wavelength there. <laughs> um, in our email exchange, you noted that some of your favorite storytellers are songwriters. You mentioned Bob Dylan, Tom Waits, and Jason Isbell. And I was very interested to hear that, Steve, because it connects with a conviction of mine that storytelling, narrative poetry, and lyric songwriting are, so to speak, three sides of the same two-sided coin. So I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit more about the relationship between songwriting and storytelling, particularly uh, in your interest in these three uh, songwriters. 
Yeah, you know, to be to be very honest, I mean, I, I hugely respect novelists and short story writers, and please don't misconstrue any of what I'm going to say as a put down. But to tell a complete and textured story in three and a half minutes and make it rhyme and make it fit and make it, you know, fit a, a you know, a melodic scheme is to, to my point of view, really, really, really hard. And uh, when, when I'm struggling or when I'm feeling stuck, I listen to Tom Waits. Uh, he is such a wordsmith and he can say so much in a line or two um, that uh, I, I'm just kind of in, in awe of, of those guys and many others. I mean, Joni Mitchell, uh, we, could, we could keep going here. Right, right. But the, the most skillful song music lyricists are by and large pretty brilliant songwriters. Uh, the other thing I'd say about that is, is uh, what, what is the Miles Davis quote? It's something about, um, it, it's, 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 it's not always the notes you play, it's the notes you don't play. <laughs> and people get hung up, really hung up on detail in story writing, right? And I'm not gonna disagree, I mean, great detail makes a great story. But, uh, just, and I'm not saying what I, what I did tonight was a great story, okay? But <laughs> as I was writing and editing it, uh, when, I, when I, I wrote something about it smelled like spring. And I wrote a couple or three sentences about describing what spring smells like. But then, I, well, well, wait a minute. We all here have experienced spring. Why don't I let, why don't I just put that out there and let people fill in the blank with their own senses of spring? Isn't that better than put my, putting mine on there? I. I also went into gruesome detail on what that bloody icy rag in my mouth tasted like. And I thought, well, for a different reason, maybe that's too much detail there too. But, but the point is, um, you know, I, I like when my process of writing, so today's thing was probably six minutes. I think it probably started as 10 or 11 minutes. And I cut and cut and cut. And sometimes I cut what I think has been meticulous detail because I want to leave that to the reader or read it or, or leave it to the listener. So, you know, so Miles Davis's music uh, example really resonates with me as a writer too. How much detail to give and how much detail to let the reader live. Uh, and as I grow older and tell more stories, I think I'm tending more to let, let the reader's mind go with it more. Well, um, one quick question, and then we do need to begin to wrap up. And uh, it's essentially the same question. In about 30 or 60 seconds, what advice would you give someone who's thinking about telling a story for the first time? Wow. <laughs> well, just your quick thought. Well, but, uh, Part of it is what I just said, splatter it out. You know, when, when you first sit down to write, just brain dump, just throw everything on the page. Um, don't assume that you know where the beginning of the story is. The beginning of the story might be at the end. The one I told today, the beginning of the story was sort of in the middle, right? So throw it all down in as much detail as you can remember and then start rearranging it and, and sorting out. Uh, but that, that first, what I call, I call it splatter because that's kind of what I do, uh, is really a great way to get everything down. You know, don't edit as you're doing it. Don't even think as you're doing it. Get it down and then look at organization and then look at rhythm if you want to play with rhythm. Then look at what details to include and what not to include. Uh, don't ever think that your first take is going to be your best take. It, in 40 years, mine has never been my best take. <laughs>
Okay, well, friends, this brings us to the end of our conversation with Steve. Again, thank you for your story and for our conversation. Uh, we know that you have more stories to tell and we would like to hear them. So this also brings us to the end of our show. Thanks to our True Tales Live team, whose names you will see on the credit scroll. A virtual round of applause for them, please. And you can keep up to date with True Tales Live through our website, through our Facebook page, and our e-newsletter, True Tales Times, which you can sign up for on our website. Our next show, as Amy mentioned, is Tuesday, May 25th. The theme is Blunders, and we hope you'll join us. Our next workshop is a week from today on May 4th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And if you are considering telling the story, as Amy says, we strongly encourage you to attend a workshop. Signing up on our website is the way to go. They're good, they're fun, and they're safe. Edited by John Lovering, tonight's show will be posted on PPM TV's YouTube channel, channel 2098 in Portsmouth. Tell your friends to look for it. That's it for tonight's show. Thanks to our tellers, our crew, and you. My name is David Frainer. Thank you again, and good night. Thank you.